I'm going to go ahead and, and just get started here. Uh, we, uh, we have a, a pretty big project going on here. Uh, lots of con contributors. This particular slide set uh, mainly developed by myself and I'm the uh, Central Region SSD Chief, also a member of the uh, National Blend of Models Testing and Evaluation Team, which is responsible for what you're viewing today. Uh, one of the members uh, of the or actually the co-lead of the National Model Blender Outreach Team is John Gagan, lead forecaster at Springfield. Uh, he's the Central Region Grid Methodology Advisory Team lead. Also another hat he wears is the vice chair of the Central Region NWSEO. John is uh, nice enough to join us after battling not only lots of flooding but also midnight shifts. So John has graciously agreed to join and is online right now. Say hello, John. Hello. <laughs> so the realities of, of shift work, but uh, thank you very much, John, for joining. Um, so we want to kick right in here and, uh, again, thank all of the offices for, for joining. This is our second rendition of this presentation that uh, that we've been recording. For those of you who might have joined the first time on Monday, uh, this will be a repeat of that. So we welcome you back. If not, hopefully some new material. want to briefly go through uh, the origins of the National Blend. It's kind of an interesting story. Obviously, we've had several regional and local model blend initiatives uh, out there. Um, and when you look into the depths of the NAPA report, talking about uh, the word consistency shows up uh, frequently, I think at least 20 times in that report as one of our main issues uh, in the weather service is consistency of a lot of forecasts and products and how we handle things, not just gridded forecasts, but really a, a whole bunch of endeavors. This is also hit on in the Net Weather Ready Nation roadmap quite a bit. And then interestingly enough, uh, somehow a, a private company's evaluation of the global polar satellite uh, JPSS scrap mitigation study talks about how some of that risk can be mitigated by making better use of existing model data from throughout the world and not just the U.S. And Sandy Supplemental Monies tied into that actually help fund a good portion of, of the National Blend of Models project. So the main primary goal is to improve, improve both the quality and the consistency of our NDFD uh, by creating this national blend. In some ways, I call uh, a consensus or a poor man's ensemble, depending on your, but uh, blends and ensembles are somewhat interchangeable depending on your point of view. But from a purist standpoint, uh, it's a blend. An ensemble is a, a is a single model with lots of different uh, variations in boundary conditions and physics, physical packages, things of that nature. Uh, our goal was to start with essentially the extended forecast period, days three to eight, and in our current deterministic uh, way of doing business and then eventually extend uh, to days 1 to 10 and uh, probabilistic products as well. Obviously, we do probability of precipitation, but uh, we need to extend uh, our probabilistic suite to, to pretty much all the elements that we do. At this time, we're doing two cycles per day based on 0 and 12Z guidance. 
uh, one thing, uh, when you look at the purpose and the end state, uh, Weather Ready Nation calls for a COP or common, common operating picture. And there's been a lot of discussion uh, with particularly high level and sophisticated users of our products that having too, too many different forecasts per se, for example, QPF, having a National Center version, having NDFD WFO versions, having RFCs that use at times a different version, although it may be similar, it may be still slightly different, and then all the various model versions. The idea of a common operating picture is singing from one seat, a sheet of music to make sure that the customers are getting a consistent message no matter whether they're looking at the local level or the national level. And along those lines, uh, we believe that the national blend of models is a baby step, if you will, an iterative step towards having a common operating picture in the NWS. So starting out with the blend components, uh, global models initially are, are being harnessed, the European and its ensembles, the GFS and the associate ensembles, and the Canadian ensembles. Kind of in the grayed out area, we have future models that we plan on, including the deterministic Canadian, uh, FENMOC, which is the Navy model, the, the replacement for no gaps, and uh, the UK Met Office has also expressed interest in, in having us uh, use the, their output in the national blend of models. So eventually, in later phases, after we've uh, got the global models running in the blend, we look to expand to many of the higher resolution models uh, in the, the what should become the HREF, or High Resolution Ensemble Forecast, things like the HER and the RAP and all the high resolution nests uh, uh, of, of the NAM model. So looking at some of the potential drawbacks to blends like the National Blend of Models versus single deterministic NWP, uh, Details in a blend will sometimes be smoother, and, in many, and, and a lot of that depends on the uncertainty of the members. If you have very good agreement, you're not going to see as much uh, of this smoothing problem. Uh, as you get further out in the extended, you tend to see more smoothing of, of details when you have particularly a lot of uncertainty. Uh, However, there's very sophisticated downscaling techniques that are applied to this. And we've seen even with regional blends that this downscaling will reduce the, and you can see a lot of detail at times, even in a blended forecast. So one of the first things, when you have a lot of uncertainty, if you have a front and one model that's a couple, three states different in location than another, obviously you're going to blend together a sharp gradient, even an Arctic front is going to look washed out when there's a lot of difference in opinion about where the location is. And that's going to be something that's very difficult to deal with until the model agreement improves, which is typically what happens as the forecast gets closer to day one. Is and we normally see pretty good agreement after day. It's more of a problem day six and seven operationally. As you get into days four and five, you tend to see less of an issue. And then uh, it, it tends to sharpen up pretty well as you get into the first two to three days. Another problem that's very difficult to deal with mathematically is if you have large variations in the locations of fronts or high and low pressures, you're going to get erratic winds uh, uh, when you blend them, lots of variation in speeds and, and, and direction. That's very difficult to deal with. Uh, and they've 
tried to do their best with very sophisticated techniques, but there still will be at times erratic winds during uncertain frontal and, and uh, synoptic system locations. So some other differences that are uh, worth noting. Most of our regional blends, for example, some of the central region examples like bias corrected consensus all and super blend, these are static blends for the most part. There are some local ver uh, models that do vary based on regime, but for the most part you see that the weights are assigned, they don't change. Something like the European maybe 12% of the blend, the GFS 5, we don't have sophisticated seasonal changes built in. However, with the National Blend of Models, you're looking at daily changes in the weightings. Uh, rolling 30-day verification, uh, these are, this is a fine-tuned model to the, the IRMA, which is, the IRMA is basically this, the six-hour version of the RTMA that waits six hours for the latest data, particularly a lot of the uh, meso nets and MATIS data that might come in late is used and each day there's a rolling 30-day verification that bias corrects that to the IRMA. Uh, so these weightings vary not only daily but at each grid point so it's not the same weighting uh, across the country and we'll show you some examples from Seattle, Albuquerque, and Atlanta back in March that they're likely going to be different uh, even on the same particular day. Uh, here's, again, an example. It's a fairly big distance across the country between Atlanta, Albuquerque, and Seattle. So we'll look at a, the weightings uh, for a 120-hour or roughly day five forecast for the first couple of weeks in March. And here we start with Seattle. And you see the seven different components uh, that, comp co that, are, that are weighted here. And if you think about it, if you had a perfectly equal weighting, each of the members would be 14%. And so you see that in general, these lines are scattered about somewhere around 14%. You have some values with the uh, bias corrected GFS and Canadian ensembles down around 9 or 10 percent. Uh, you also see up near the top the European gridded moss and the GFS gridded moss being up closer to 20 percent. But you see they do vary a little bit daily. Um, and again, this is at Seattle. If you go to uh, our next slide at Albuquerque, you see that there's actually less spread here between the weightings uh, and a little bit higher values, the lowest members being up around 11 or 12 percent and the highest members down around 16, 17 percent. And you see that some variations over time between what the highest weightings are. And then going again to uh, Atlanta, to show one other example, you see, again, uh, there's a tendency for the, you know, the European is a very good model, and there's a tendency for it to have uh, higher weightings in a lot of these examples, but we're not talking about a massive difference, maybe one or two percent between the GFS and the European MOS, um, and again, all based on verification over long periods of time. So some other things to discuss about the availability um, uh, of the blend, and there's some latency issues that I think deserve some discussion here. In general, the latency between when the official runtime, say the 12Z national blend of models, and when it's available is on the order of 12 hours, it's actually somewhere around 10 to 11 hours, but there are some additional time differences that it takes to to uh, process the, the the grib files and and ship them through the LDM out to your office. And one of the primary reasons for this late arrival is the 
European and particularly the European ensembles. If you want to include them, you have to wait quite a bit longer. So in general, the 0Z run will be available around 12Z and, and vice versa. 12Z runs not available until about 0Z. Verification suggests that waiting for the European ensembles is, and, and ensembles are justified. Again, this is one of this is certainly a, something that will be discussed quite a while. Is is you know what is what is our vision for how we would use uh, the blend and what to include and what the data cutoffs are. So this is far from from a done discussion, but it is something that we uh, are evaluating right now. And obviously, your evaluation would be interesting to see um, about the feasibility of using it with these current time, uh, time delivery windows. So this output is generated via the SBN, you know, down, down the line particularly, will be generated to the SBN on AWIPS and GFE like any other guidance. There will, the blend will be just like any other model that you would see in AWIPS. And right now, that with through the LDM, most of you should be getting the temperature and dew point. Uh, there, we won't touch on it too long, but the, we're currently uh, getting sky cover and wind and wind gust uh, developed, and they should be available hopefully within the next couple of weeks or so, and hopefully by early August, uh, Pop 12 max temperature, min temperature uh, should be uh, available for the evaluation. So uh, we were hoping to get these in July, and roughly half of them will be available in July, and, and then the remainder hopefully by early August. So our outcomes, we expect uh, better guidance for the NDFD to uh, have consistent forecasts, both at the local level and at the national level. We also expect to have better uh, consistency or deterministic guidance in terms of bias and errors, lower bias and lower mean absolute error. We're hoping to develop probabilistic guidance that improves our detection of extreme events. An example might be the probability of, of threshold exceedance, such as two inches of QPF. What's the probability of, of exceedance based on the multi-model blends? We expect to have better representation of complex terrain, uh, especially considering we're deriving in the extended forecast periods from a much coarser global model. Uh, and downscaling it down to two and a half kilometers, and we're we're very encouraged by the by the early results and verification. Uh, I'm going to show you a couple other things first, but eventually we'll get to both February and May snapshots of verification for you to consider. So let's get back to the handling of complex terrain. We want to let you know that there's considerable effort to uh, make sure that we have common terrain files. Uh, this has been a problem for a while. And there's uh, AWIPS build 1511 scheduled in September should have improved uh, and common terrain files. Uh, we, we want the National Blend of Models, the IRMA, and GFE by December to all have common terrain, which means in AWIPS, you could be looking at fairly substantial changes in terrain values at grid points that could be uh, over a 1,000 meters in some cases or a kilometer. Uh, but having that common terrain should should be very helpful for for a host of, of applications, and particularly in verification, we, we see some fairly interesting verification behavior depending on what what terrain files and what background analyses you use. 
so that we can get an apples to apples of comparison. So looking back to the February, and again, this is gridded verification for, I believe, the entire CONUS uh, from uh, time 12 all the way up to 156 hours for temperature. Uh, you see a fairly substantial improvement in mean absolute error between the NDFD and the blend. I will put a little asterisk next to that that we will discuss uh, with some later verification. That would be comparing, say, the 12Z NDFD forecast to the 12Z version of the blend, which in some way, since it's available about 12 hours later after the forecast is issued, is somewhat of an apples to oranges comparison. So what you'll see in the later slides is we actually do both the current and the previous run of the blend, which we'll call the PC blend for the previous, and show you that there's, there is some difference, but there still seems to be very valid reasons to even use the previous version of the blend in terms of verification. Another thing you should probably notice, we're, we focused on global models out, particularly days four, but notice that the improvements in the blend are throughout the uh, short term as well, uh, even though we're using coarse global models and not necessarily some of the higher resolution models that we have, like like the NAM and the HER, the RAP, uh, and SREF and other things of that nature. Here on dew point, WPC doesn't do forecasts of just temperature. They do max and min temperature, but they do do dew point. And you notice they're very competitive with the NDFD. And in fact, in this month, showing uh, improvement over the NDFD in the day six and seven period, and very competitive with the blend at 156 hours. So here going to May to show you some, again, temperature. Here are the, the ad additional data points to consider are the triangle where we have the uh, previous version of the blend. And you see that with temperature, there is a little bit of a drop off, but it's still showing improvement over the NDFD forecast for the whole country um, throughout the period, really. Although, notice that, and again, this continues to intrigue me, the improvement over the NDFD is less apparent in the extended and more apparent in the short term, which is a little bit of a surprise to me, anyhow, without the inclusion of some of the higher resolution short term models. And going to dew point, you see similar behavior, a uh, slight improvement on the of the previous run over the it's interesting that that improvement seems to be more uh, concentrated in the extended the improvement of the of the new run of the blend over the old is more distinct in the extended than the short term also notice uh, WPC guidance here very competitive with the previous or the, the current version of the blend and actually beating the the older version, the 12-hour older version. And in fact, out around day six and seven, uh, being one of the best sources of guidance. So uh, interesting data there. So some ways to evaluate the national blend of models. Uh, you should be getting, most of you should be getting uh, Many of you have access to Boyce Verify uh, summary stats that are issued from your office. Uh, we're Some of us on the team are getting those to compare daily some of the verification. Uh, there's also a very nice uh, model blender viewer uh, that uh, you use your LDAP login and password like you would typically get into your Google Mail. And you can evaluate both analysis and forecast on that, both individual days and monthly information. So here's an example of of the day seven temperature forecast a while back for May. And what's neat about some of this is not, I, 
not to call out my friend in, in Sterling, but we actually seem to have found, using this verification, a systematic issue with their diurnal tool at zero Z. I, I, I'm just making that guess. We don't know for sure, but they tend to have a little bit of a warm bias there. And so these those kind of things show up very nicely in these analyses. You can see that the it shows the grid point error, mean absolute error, and the color scheme, and then the average for the whole county warning area is indicated. So, for example, down here in, in uh, the Sterling area, a mean absolute error around 7 degrees, uh, the uh, blend being about 4 degrees, 4.1 degrees different from Irma, the previous version being having a little bit more error, about 4.5 degrees. And then here we see showing the biases. You can see this warm bias of about 6.5 degrees. So these tools are not only good for evaluating the blend and other model guidance, but actually seeing if there's a, as you can see, the, the State College Office has, seems to be doing very well on their zero Z forecast with errors down around only about uh, 0.8, or bias only about 0.8 where there tends to be a war warmer bias elsewhere. So very useful information. And looking at a similar case for dew point, one of the nice features of this tool is the circle indicates a sampling. And i gone up into the Bingham, northern part of Binghamton's area and did a sample. And it shows a mean absolute error for that grid point of about 7.2 degrees shows the lat longitude and the approximate elevation in meters based on their the, that grid point and its terrain file. Um, here, the error on the blend versus Irma was about 5.4 degrees at that location. And going to the previous version, you see there's slightly more error, as you might expect, about 6.1 degrees, but still somewhat better than than that of, of Binghamton's NDFD forecast. And then here, showing WPC with the error of about 7.1 degrees. So it's very easy to compare and contrast uh, all these. So some, some questions and concerns that we might have had over, the, over time uh, about components. Well, well why, why choose every, the so-called everything in the in the kitchen sink. Um, why not just uh, throw out some of the lower performing components in the blend? I mean, if the European guidance is uh, often more superior, then why not use a heavier weighting of that? Um, I, th I think you'll be curious. There, there tends to be a, a compensating uh, effect of having a lot more members, a lot more uh, dispersion of, of potential solutions. Because even though over time a particular guidance might be have a better mean absolute error, for any particular event, it might not be the best guidance. And we see that quite often is that uh, sometimes even the DJX or some other guidance that they uh, someone might determine is not very good will be the best uh, example. And so comparing the blend to mean absolute error of one of the better members, the, the bias corrected European moss, you see on the temperatures for a period of, of roughly three months, you have very similar performance in the short term. This would be days one, two, three, four, five, six, seven, roughly. You start to see out in the extended that the blend has lower mean absolute error than one of the better, better components. And as you go to dew point, you see almost across the board improvement, but especially out in the extended. So. You know the the blend over time does tend to outperform even some of the better members, uh, and on individual events, there's not a, you know there's also a tendency. It's even if you pick 
the European and you roll with it, you sometimes may, in a pattern like with that it would be a colder than normal pattern, something with a little bit more of a cool bias, such as the GFS, might actually perform better on an individual event. So in summarizing all this, uh, we have dynamic model blend weightings in the national blend of models. These are based on rolling verification, so it tries to tune to models that are, have a heavier hand get a, or a hotter hand get a heavier weighting. And static regional blends don't change, so that is a significant difference. Um, one thing that should note that, that we're going to be evaluating is that we're downscaling and bias correcting and tuning to the IRMA, to the, to the unrestricted real-time analysis, or, or we're doing that to all the time. And some of the other uh, regional blends, so for example, in the central region, bias correction consensus all would be a fairly good uh, comparison. Some of the raw output that we do in the regional blends, we, we don't really do that at the current time because there's been a lot of focus on trying to get complex terrain like coastlines and, and, and mountains and whatnot correct. Water, you know, area, large bodies of water uh, versus land areas. So that's been the major focus to get that. So that, that is something that you should be aware of, that if you have a really big pattern change, it's possible that the bias correction may be so tuned to the previous pattern that it may, it may have some trouble initially until it catches up. Um, blending tends to outperform any of the individual components, even the best performing ones. So a while back, Aristotle said that the whole is greater than the sum of its parts, and that seems to be true for doing model blending and, and doing a consensus approach is that um, it, it, it's surprising, but the inclusion of so-called lower performing members doesn't seem to hurt the overall performance. It seems to improve it, in, in fact, which is can be counterintuitive. So how are we giving feedback? Um, there's a couple of ways. Our, our virtual lab has a a feedback form set up for those of you familiar with logging into it. Um, you can go and look for the national blend of models and join the join that group, and then you can get in and enter into the form, attach images, whatnot. If you haven't already, I would encourage you to try it. After the learning curve is kind of steep, but after getting in and, and looking around, you'll see there's a lot of flexibility there. Uh, there is an easy button, though. If you send an email to national.blend.feedback at noaa.gov and attach images, this will automatically post to that form on VLAB. Um, and please, uh, although it, hopefully it will be obvious in any images, it would still be nice when you write up your case is to provide the date and time of the event and in some cases the forecast hour so that it, it makes it easier for us to and the developers because again this is a, this is a direct pipeline to the developers uh, for those of you who participated in the RTMA and IRMA evaluations that was very very successful from the developer standpoint lots of feedback direct interaction with the with the power users out in the field and WPC and whatnot and they they it was very helpful so we're trying to build on that success uh, so we, we're looking forward to that feedback some of the things we're looking at uh, in particular for feedback on is how it handles frontal passages as we get into the fall and early winter snow cover Obviously, the mountains are always going to be, with the high resolution needs of the complex terrain, are always going to be in demand. Fire weather and deep mixing, how does it handle uh, very hot, dry, and windy conditions that are critical for fire weather? 
uh, coastal areas, of course, with their own uh, interesting issues and the, the differences between the land and water. And then as we get in, uh, have some tropical systems, of course, it's a strong El Nino, so that will limit our possibilities somewhat uh, with our eastern offices. But when we get a land falling tropical system, how does, how does it handle temperature and wind and dew point and wind fields uh, and eventually pot fields? Particularly interested in how, when if you take a look at it and try to run the TCM tool on it when you're evaluating it, how does it you know, distribute the winds offshore versus onshore with the typical frictional effects and whatnot that are uh, at times challenging? So. That ends my uh, formal presentation. I certainly would like to entertain for John Gagan and I any questions you might have. I'd also be curious, on our last, our last call, we were missing a few offices, and I was hoping that uh, uh, kind of a roll call of sorts. I hear Jacksonville was on. Did we get El Paso on this time, or Santa Teresa? OK. Um, how about, I think Billings. Was Billings on last time? I don't think so. Did we get Billings this time? OK, guess not. Uh, any, any questions uh, or yes. comments? Hey, uh, yes. Hey, Jeff, this is uh, ha uh, Harry and Bill at Gr Greenville Spartanburg. Okay. Uh, thank, th thank you for uh, for the fine presentation. Um, I did have a, qu a question about the, um, the verification summary statistics we get on the NBM via the emails. Um, I, I suppose you folks are are getting those from from the test offices as well. Um, within the verification summaries, there are a couple of ways in there of of um, assessing how the NBM is doing against the various other models. We have a, a, a co co column that says percent improvement over super blend, and then we have a separate one that lists the NBM rank among the, uh, the other guidance. Uh, we, we've noticed, however, that the two do not appear to be using the same metric. Um, we've had days where the percent improvement over Superblend has been ne negative, but the NBM rank has been number one. So could, could you speak a little bit on the metrics that are used in the verification statistics? Okay, I'm trying to find this, I'm going to use an example of your temperature, so hopefully you, you can see this uh, GSP temperature verification summary for 12Z uh, yeah. yesterday. Okay. Hey Jeff, do, you, do you happen to have the email from July 3rd, the, zero, the temperature 0Z zero verification email um, for Friday, July 3rd at Let's see. It, it's the period from July third, twelve Z, to Saturday, July fourth, twelve Z. Okay. I'm. I'm look. Now, is that the zero Z or the twelve Z version? Let's see. So that would be the the zero Z one. Um, and this the, would be temperature for yeah, Friday, July third. Exactly. At zero Z. Let me let me get that. It looks like it was fairly early in the. Looks like you'd been getting the data for about four days at that yeah, point. Yeah, I got so an gonna... email, Jeff, on uh, sat on Saturday evening, July fourth. So you probably would have gotten it about the same time. Okay, so I'm on yeah. the first day. Did you want to look at day seven or day? Yeah, that's fine there, Jeff. If you look at day one, if you look at the very first entry in that chart, um, percent super, percent improvement over super blend was a negative 4.68%. Uh, 
and the NBM rank among the guidance was 1 out of 41. You'll notice the – did you see that, Jeff? Yeah, I, I do see that. I see okay. that super yeah. blend – yeah. yeah, I think this is, uh, this is Jeff Wallstreich here. I think the rank uses the uh, percent uh, less than three degree error. Right. While the percent improvement is 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 the MAE. Statistic. So why do why do we want to reflect percent improvement using one m metric, but then provide the ranking by by using a different one? That's, an, that's a, actually an excellent question. Um, I think I think what you're seeing here is a reflection of some prefer to see the mean absolute error, and some to see prefer to see the ranking. The percent less than three degrees is considered, you know, what's what's a good hit if you have a landing a window of about three degrees either side. So I think this was to try to satisfy both both sets of verification customers. Um, I can see where it's confusing, and you know, I, I do appreciate that. Um, I I think I think that that what Jeff said was was correct is that we, we were trying to give two different groups of people. Uh, something that they would consider as more useful information. Um, I can see the need to make make sure that we point this out. Or the other option is this is a this is a coding mistake and that it actually is an error. So I, I'm going to have to double check on that. Well, I I mean I think that maybe this just may be similar to I mean this is really a boy you know uh, a boy to verify. Thing where I think NBM is getting replaced from NDFD, but you, you know, but you so you really had, you know, if you're running this these emails separate in Boise Verify, separate from the, the Blender project, you would be seeing the NDFD, the official NDFD forecast rank, right, using a similar metric relative, and then you'd have a I forget what the percent improvement was that would be over. It may be gridded, may have been gridded moss. I forget what the default was. Right, you can you can do a percent versus anything. At one time we used moss, and then we switched to consensus all, and then you know super blend is sort of becoming the 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 gold standard of of sorts. Uh, but that is interesting, and I appreciate you pointing that out because that that can potentially be. I, unfortunately, I'm so used to looking at this for so many years that you know I, I don't I shouldn't make those assumptions that everyone understands what they're looking at. So okay, I appreciate you bringing good. that up. Yeah, I'm, I'm looking. I'm looking at Charleston's who hasn't got the super blend running at the moment, and they actually see percent improvement over official there, and then the rank is the same. You know that yeah you know, relative to that three degree error score. Yeah, I, that that's an interesting one. Another thing that happens, though, at times is we do we do see kind of odd behavior early on. Like, for example, the seven day averages I would put very little weight in because it's really only four days, and then you'll see the same number in the fifteen and the 30 days, even though you've only done it for four days. So a lot of that information is somewhat dubious at best. So exactly. when, once you got it running for 15 to 30 days, it'll start to – but I'm going to double-check with Jerry on that, and, and I, it's an excellent question to make sure that, we're, that we didn't make some kind of error when we, we, we adjusted this. Okay, that's helpful. Thanks again, Jerry. Jeff and Jeff, and if you take a look at the latest statistics, the NBM has a clean sweep. It's number one among the sources at every time projection. Yeah, I, I, I was seeing, I was looking at 
uh, CWA by CWA scores for May on the blend on the on the um, on the verification site, and I was pretty much seeing just about. A, a, a meaningful several tenths of a degree improvement on from monthly MAEs for every CWA over the you know over the official uh, NDFD. Uh, so this has been very encouraging in what I've seen, what I've been seeing thus far in verification. -wise. Now, what I'm trying to rem another thing that I should know, and I apologize if I my brain is jumbled here, but we're I'm thinking we're you are are we using I wish Jerry was on here. <laughs> um, in fact I might be able to Are you on, Jerry? I am on. Okay. Uh did did we explain that properly as far as the difference between the ranking and the percent is the imp percent improvement over super blend a comparison of the MAE? Yeah, that's correct. Okay. Now the other question was, and this is something that I think is important that I neglect. Are we comparing? Are we using the Irma as ground truth, or are we using our back whatever background uh, match match obs all fields that uh, f as the verifying analysis? No, we're using the Irma. Okay. So this is compared to Irma, which right. is which obviously is what the blender is tuning to. So what, when, when you can do comparisons, between, if, for those of you that use the Boyce Verify summaries a lot, if you're tuning, if your OBS database is using something different, like for example in Central Region, we use a blend of five background fields and then do match OBS all, we get the numbers are different, obviously, because you're you're, you're using a slightly different analysis um, in order to uh, do the comparison. So you're going to see differences in performance. And obviously, since the since we're tuning the blender to Irma, if we're using that as the background field, it we should see uh, pretty good performance. You might see slightly different results. For those that use, because we, we do do two different fields in Boyce Verify, we do a CWA wide all grid points, and we also do all the ASOS AWAS sites for just the grid point included in it, and you get similar but slightly different results. So something to be aware of. Thank you, Jerry. Other questions or comments? Yeah, just sort of a conceptual question. The change of the weights on day-to-day -day basis is certainly interesting. I was wondering if there's any attempt going on to, to, to see that's really an improvement by itself. Do you still check a fixed weighting against the dynamic weighting thing, or is there any, is that already been evaluated or something? That's an excellent question. Uh, Dave Myrick, are you on? Hey, this, this is Kathy. Um, that was one of the tests Bruce Wienheis and MDL had done really early on. He tried some different uh, weighting schemes and had a fixed weight, and we did see a little bit of improvement uh, letting it go grid point by grid point. And that was also something when we scoped out the project, you know, almost two years ago now, where the, the field really wanted to see us do it this way. They didn't want to see fixed weight. Okay, that's, I was just curious. It, the concept is similar to something called what the W model in the Kong's all that's already been produced. And um, that hasn't been as successful as we would have liked it to have been. I mean, it's okay, but it's not by itself a big improvement. But um, it does add to the complexity of the blend that makes any bias is more complicated uh, than possible outcome of that. Part of, part of the reason, too, to get away from having the fixed weight is it protects us a little bit from model upgrades. So it'll learn a little bit faster than, than us having to go in and recalibrate everything and get another implementation in at NCO. Right. 
Right. So there's, there's a couple reasons, I think, to do it this way, but I can I can check back with MDL to see if they would still have those tests around. It, it's been over yeah, a year ago that they looked at it. That's fine. I, I guess the answer is that they're not doing an ongoing validation of that approach with this test. No. Okay. Yeah, the W model is a rolling seven-day verification, so it it actually do, it goes for the really really hot hand, and it only selects three mo the top three models. So it's I think even though it's a similar concept, I think it's it's such a crude version of this that the the performance on this I think is going to be probably it's probably going to be better because there's less reliance on just picking the top three models and those top three models may quickly fall out of favor if a front goes through but if you're looking at 30-day rolling verification you're not focusing so much on just the hottest hand in the last week and also as you've probably noticed the weightings the weightings in W model are 50, 33, and 17 percent. Here you notice in some of those graphs that you were varying a few percentage points above and below 14. So it's not extreme differences. It's it's slight adjustments to to the weightings so far. I mean, maybe it'll maybe it. I guess it's theoretically it could be much bigger differences, but. I'm not sure it would ever do like 100% of one model, would it? <laughs> I don't think it was designed that way, right, Kathy? No, I don't think, I don't, I can't imagine a situation where that would happen. It might be theoretically possible, but it's not likely. Yeah, yeah interesting question. I suspect it may be, as you said, a case where it's not going to make a huge difference. It's just one of the refinements that you have going on. Other qu any any comments by our uh, by John John Gig and anything you'd want to add other than yeah, Jeff. maybe a, cu a cup of coffee? <laughs> <laughs> uh, can you hear me, Jeff? Yes. Yeah. Regarding that last question, uh, you know, when we went to through the optimization uh, to what we now know as Superblend, uh, you know, a couple of years back. Uh, we actually saw variations in from day to day, from day four to day five to day six to day seven. We saw variations much like what uh, is shown with the individual components of the National Blend of Models, um, uh, the the, the uh, verification you showed earlier, the breakdown, uh, you know, day by day of uh, the percentages of each. We actually saw those variations when we were doing the optimization with Paul Wolin's work. Um, so, you know, that existed. It's just, you know, for Super Blend, we kind of had to pick one and go with it, uh, what was most representative over those four days, rather than do something individually on each day. Ideally, we would have been able to do something like that, but just a little too advanced and complicated for, for what we have on our systems in the local WFO versus what can be done nationally. So, you know, it's a very, very good point, very good question, um, uh, and I think going with the dynamic weighting, uh, you know, over the 30 days is, is, is going to be helpful in the long run. So uh, otherwise, uh, no other comments on my end. Um, any, anyone else? Uh, I know, uh, we, you know, WFOs aren't the only ones involved here uh, in the evaluation. WPC is taking a look at this, of course. So I don't know if Kathy or Dave Novak wanted to make any other comments about about their their evaluations of this. And no, not yet. Excellent. Anybody? getting close to top of the hour and I, I know everybody's busy and we do appreciate it. any other questions or comments before we start to wrap up hey Jeff this is Jerry just a quick question um, are, there, are we going to be able to see any of the like sort of deterministic models that are going into the national bundle models because I saw that there was a bias corrected European moss in there and I can that, that would be something that 
I would be interested in seeing. Is that going to ever be available for us? Well, um, Kathy is much more involved. I can give you a, a, my simplistic answer, but I, I think right now we're in a situation where the Europeans are very sensitive about the use of of this, and I, I, I don't anticipate us sending out individual components, although you know, I know a lot of us have been sort of generating the European moss and bias correcting it uh, locally, but I don't, I, my first guess is it, it, it'd be a while before we actually would send out individual components like that for those reasons. But I don't know, Kathy, if that if that's kind of what you're thinking. I think that's going to be discouraged. Uh, I I don't I think. The answer would be no to that. Yeah, I, I mean, I don't think we have support from certainly the AA's office, and it may undermine our efforts to try to to have consistent guidance if we send all the components out there for everything to be recreated again locally. Yeah, I think the the goal was to have one one product and one good starting point. Um, yeah, I, I, I'm thinking no at this point is just, just the way things have been going. Yeah, that's fine. I, I was just curious because, you know, it'd be interesting to look at. I understand that, the, you know, that the idea is to have one starting point, but I was just curious if we could ever at least be able to see that just for, you know, something else to look at. But I, yeah, I can appreciate the answers. So I uh, appreciate everyone being on. Uh, one last um, note, uh, we, we have received a couple of uh, evaluations uh, of, of specific weather events for the blend. Um, now that just about everybody's ingesting temperature and dew point. We'd li really love to start hearing from you. Uh, obviously, you're not going to have, won't be able to have a chance, or there won't be a requirement to send in fee specific feedback every shift. But we'd like to see both good and bad examples uh, start to roll in so that the, d the developers have a window, uh, the first window, uh, goes through about the 10th of 10th of September, so we, I would say July and August are pretty critical months for us to get feedback on particularly temperature and dew point, uh, and then as the other ones roll in, because we have deadlines to get code to to NCO for for operationally running in December, so the earlier you can start giving feedback, the better. Uh, to, to help ma meet some of these deadlines. So we'd really appreciate uh, seeing some feedback from you. And there's been a couple, three excellent uh, examples, but we're looking for a little bit more volume. So please, please, if you have a good case, uh, give us some feedback on the forum, and we really appreciate it. If there's nothing else, thank you very much for attending, and thanks much for your office volunteering for this very important endeavor, and uh, thank you.